Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Welcome to the Master Mix Podcast. Thanks for listening. My name is Mike and Navina, and I am super excited to be with you today. I'm really excited because I've actually been away from recording podcast episodes for the last month. Um, today, the day I'm recording this episode is February 9th, and one month ago, my wife and I welcomed our first child into the world. We had a baby girl who's awesome. Her name is Olivia, and it's been amazing so far being a dad. It's just like a crazy experience, and you know, you're constantly learning all sorts of new things and um, you know, you're adapting to a lot of new things as well, right? You're getting used to constantly being peed on, pooped on, puked on, uh, no sleep, all that kind of stuff. It's fun stuff, right? I guess when I describe it that way, it sounds like it's really negative and like, why would anyone want to do this? But there's a lot of positive stuff that goes along with it. And it's just been amazing, uh, you know, just seeing someone learn the world, right? And like go through all sorts of brand new experiences. And you know, I, ju I just think that uh, as we get older, we often take for granted a lot of the amazing things that are around us. And, uh, you know, being able to see my daughter's reaction when she hears music for the first time, or when she sees a new building or like some new object, you know, it, it's, uh, it's just something that's really magical and, and definitely have been enjoying that. And, uh, Having a baby is totally going to make me become a wimp now. I can totally tell. But, uh, you know, it's it's all fun stuff. I really enjoy this and uh, loving this chapter of my life so far. And oddly enough, I've had this weird surge of creativity lately, which has been great because uh, in these late night feedings where I'm just kind of waiting around for my daughter to either like wake up or, uh, you know, start my shift to, to feed her and that kind of stuff. I've been able to actually start writing a lot of great stuff. And I've actually been working on a brand new book, which is going to be all about recording and properly setting up your microphones and being strategic and methodical about the way you position things and getting the sounds that you hear in your head to come out of your speakers just through proper recording technique. Now, this book is still a work in progress. I have no ETA for when it's going to be done, um, but I've put a really solid dent into it. So I'm really excited to be making that progress and hopefully I can get it out sooner than later. But just figured I'd put the word out there and let you guys know that something's in the works. So uh, really excited for you guys to learn about that once it's finally done. But today I'm really excited because it's been about a month or so since I last worked on a podcast. So it's great to get back into the swing of things and to be interviewing people. And today is a great episode that you're really going to enjoy. Today, I'm interviewing Jim Anderson, who is an engineer who has been in the industry for nearly 50 years and primarily in the acoustic music world. So working on a lot of jazz and orchestral stuff. And Jim is definitely someone who has done a lot of amazing work in his day. He has won 13 Grammys and Latin Grammy Awards, two Peabody Awards. He's got a pair of Emmy nominations. The guy's absolutely crushing it and doing amazing work. So if you're a fan of any sort of jazz music, I mean, you, you got to check out his, his discography because there's a lot of really great stuff in there. This episode's a really good one. Like, there's a lot of amazing information that Jim shares here. And we talk about some Topics that maybe we haven't really covered on the podcast before, uh, especially when it comes to recording instruments like piano, upright bass, horns, that kind of stuff. Jim has a lot of experience in recording those, so I definitely wanted to ask him about recording those and what his approach is and you know how that might differ from some of the typical rock stuff that we often cover on the podcast. And Jim is also the type of person who's very methodical when it comes to positioning microphones and selecting microphones. And I think you're going to find that really interesting when you hear him talk about things, because he's actually really creating... He's almost mixing with microphones and he chooses mics selectively so that certain things feel a little closer or further back in the mix. And he's just doing that all with microphones rather than getting to the, the mixing stage and adding EQ and that kind of stuff later. He's very strategic with it. And I think you're going to learn a lot from that. And it's definitely stuff that you can apply to your own recordings. And um, yeah, it's, it's not just your typical, you know, go to mic setups and that kind of thing. He's, he's very strategic with it. So yeah, I think you're going to really enjoy this episode and you're going to learn a lot. I definitely learned a lot too. And it shifted a lot of my perspective on mic techniques and stuff like that. So let's just jump right into this because I know you're going to really enjoy this one. Jim Anderson, thank you so much for being on the Master Your Mix podcast. How's it going? Uh, very well. Thanks, Mike. Awesome. For people who might not be familiar with you or your background, can you give us that story of who you are, what you do, and how you ultimately got into all of the awesome stuff you're working on these days? Sure. Um, I'm in Brooklyn presently, but uh, I started out in uh, a little town in western Pennsylvania 
uh, called Butler, PA, where um, in this little town, they had an amazing uh, arts community. Uh, and so all of my siblings played an instrument. And so I was expected to play an instrument too. And uh, But I didn't want to do what they did, which was clarinet, flute, things like that. I said, just far too complicated. I said, I want something with three buttons and that's it. And um, so I said, trumpet, worked with the trumpet for about six weeks. My father, he, he worked at a steel mill. And he said, I'm not buying an instrument. And the music teacher said, I need a French horn player. And um, I remember, I can, I really remember sitting at the kitchen table with the note from the teacher and my eldest sister drawing on a napkin what a French horn was. <laughs> and I said, sure, I'll play French horn. I don't, I don't care. And um, from there out, I was a French horn player because the school would pay for the horn. And um, so I went to Duquesne University in Pittsburgh as a French horn major. Uh, with uh, It was a music ed education because my father always said, um, uh, get the education degree. Uh, you never know when it will come in handy. And all my siblings were teachers. And uh, so I was expected to do that too. So I went, got the education degree, uh, French horn major, piano minor. I had never touched a piano until I, I got to university. So I wow. really had I really had catch up to play. And um, so I graduated there in 73 and um, started working at the local public radio station, which had just started up uh, because we had a recording studio at the university. And I was handed the keys to the recording studio by my piano teacher, of all people, uh, Sister Carol Riley. She was... Uh, um, she was looking out for me. I was walking down the hall. I had recorded her um, uh, her master's performance because the recording studio wasn't working. I had a tape machine, and I said, oh, I'll, re I'll record it for you. And I went down and recorded it, and uh, I was walking the hall one day, and she said, oh, he could probably do it. She was talking to the dean, and I said, what are you talking about? They said, oh, the recording studio. Would you like to run it? I said, sure. <laughs> so myself and another student, uh, Jim George, we um, took the place over. I had read the Alec Nesbitt book called uh, Technique of the Sound Studio. I had checked it out of the library and just read it for fun. And uh, so I had this background and um, uh, started recording the recitals. Those recitals eventually made it over to the public radio uh, station on campus. And they said, who's doing these recordings? They actually sound pretty good. Um, and, um, so from there, I spent a year at the radio station and then a job came open at national public radio. So I went straight from there, um, after a year out of college, straight to NPR as, as the newest engineer on the staff. But I was the only one that had a music degree, the only one that could read a score. Um, uh, so I, I uh, became very tight very quickly with all the cultural producers because they actually had somebody who they could talk to about music and things like that. So I was doing uh, uh, jazz concerts, opera, uh, classical music. Um, I uh, In my little studio, that smallest studio at NPR, I had the Chieftains and wow. uh, recorded that to four track, you know, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> and that, and in the studio, most of, mostly everything we did was two track. And mostly everything we did live was two track. We had almost no multi track. There, there's a few that I can remember, uh, maybe a concert at Carnegie Hall or something like that. But generally, mo and and if we did a multi track, there was probably still a live broadcast. And uh, so my background was really sitting down at the console and hitting it live, uh, regardless of what it was. I mean, it could have been uh, could be an orchestra, it could be an opera, it could be uh, anything. Um, and that was, I think, the best background. To, to step into in um, 1980. I'm sorry if this is a No, no, a go long for it. This story. is great, yeah. In 1980, I had a chance to leave NPR and go freelance. And I um, uh, eventually, within a year, made it to New York City because that's where I always wanted to live. I um, uh, So I moved to New York City and started freelancing. And I thought, you know, I'll give myself three or five years to really hit the ground running. Um, I had a couple of projects to finish at NPR that were, so I kept running back to DC and doing things and also still doing some of their big shows. I would be sent off to do the uh, New Year's Eve broadcast and things like that. Um, so with the um, uh, moving to New York City, I eventually got to know the musicians. Some of them I actually had known from doing live shows. 
for NPR, like Phil Woods, uh, Phil Woods and Phil Woods uh, Quintet, and uh, some of his uh, side musicians like Bill Goodwin, uh, who was a major producer of jazz records in the '80s and '90s, uh, and and Phyllis Drummer. So, uh, so some of those contacts actually came uh, very handy when it came to starting my career in New York City. Um, at the <laughs> at the same time. Um, I also started working from Muppets. I did the Muppets for about 10 years. No way. <laughs> and yeah. And uh, so we would do all the home videos. And uh, usually that was two weeks of work. So, when, you know, when you're freelancing, you're putting together your, your, what am I doing this week? What am I doing that, this month, next month, all that kind of thing. So I had, uh, uh, because of broadcasting and some television that I had done, I had, uh, you know, I could go from recording studio to TV to, I had done a few movies here and there. Uh, there was an IMAX movie. I was on location in Japan for three months and things like that. Um, uh, the one thing I had done at NPR, I had bought myself a stereo Nagra. So I had my own, uh, I, uh, you know, I could go out on the road and record. Um, and I had put uh, pilot tone and film sync and all that kind of thing. So I could even do, um, We I was one of the crew that worked on the Laurie Anderson Home of the Brave movie. Because I had a Nagra that could record uh, uh, sync, and so I, I tried to always have maybe a piece of gear that could actually set me apart from everybody else. Um, and then the uh, uh, kind of the jazz renaissance started happening in the late eighties, nineties, and uh, the Japanese were starting to uh, come over and make uh, recordings for you know uh, digital was brand new at the time, and they needed content that was digital. And so Sony, for example, came over and recorded 10 albums of American popular songs with 10 different singers. And those were all live to two track. And uh, I think it was between myself and another engineer, David Baker, we kind of divvied up the project. And, uh, and the best thing was we were paid by the tune. And, um, and, and uh, I was just telling a story yesterday in, in, in class at NYU, uh, Morgana King, um, who played the mother in uh, The Godfather. Uh, she, you know, consummate pro. And uh, it was the Billy Taylor Trio and Morgana King. And in fact, you know what? I found this record in Toronto in a, in a, a used record store um, a couple of trips ago. Uh, and I, I never had a, cop a vinyl copy of this thing. And um, Morgana came in, heard the first playback, and she looked at me and said, needs a little more ice. And I thought, wow, that's a that's a great way to describe, you know, putting 16K <laughs> and a little more reverb on the voice. And I, I put some ice on the, on, the, on the voice and off we went. And the best thing was being paid by the tune. We finished that record off in three hours. I don't think I was ever made, <laughs> I ever made so much money in, in such a short period of time. And cash, too. Those were the, those were the days. Um, and so, you know, it developed. And um, I started working with um, a, a producer, Kazunori Sugiyama. And we did a lot of work for DIW, Japanese labels, DIW, something, something else, which was licensing their material back to Blue Note Records. And so a lot of work we did with, uh, uh, with the, something else came out over here. Um, and then I started getting to just more and more work. Interestingly enough, a lot of that was two-track and straight to stereo. You know, there was no backup. This is long before Pro Tools. And then the project started getting bigger and bigger. I mean, the things like the Joe Henderson big band um, and um, uh, Joe Henderson. In fact, I, I did the, his kind of second record of his comeback for Verve, uh, which was a, a, which won two Grammys, you know, um, and um, and then we did his big band. And so I started working with more major artists as time went on. And um, around about 2003, uh, my kids were, uh, my daughter was in college. My son was going to go to college. And I started thinking, hmm, I could, I could probably do something else, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and so there was a university in uh, Canada that was interested in me. And uh, so I had gone to Montreal and, and spoken with them. And uh, also this new program at NYU opened up. And um, it uh, turned out that it was the Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music. And uh, they were looking for a production person. And this is where my father, God bless him, uh, comes to play. Because they were looking for a music person that had education or an education person that had music. They couldn't find either one. And I walked in with an education degree 
and uh, and 30 years of music, <laughs> 40 years of music at that point. Um, and um, they said, I think I was the next to the last person that walked in the door. And, um, and so I got the I got the job and started setting up the um, uh, the production curriculum at NYU's uh, Clive Davis department. And um, and eventually was the chair for about the first four four or five years of the program, and um, and from then on, um, I've I've been a, a te- I was a tenured professor at the university until September, and now I'm a professor emeritus at the university. And so uh, the one course that I've really believed in is critical listening, and teaching uh, students how to listen to a recording, how to dis- use the vocabulary that you and I. Mike uh, uh, would use to say, you know, we, we wouldn't say something is bright or tinny or muddy or anything like that. We would talk about very specific things. It, it you know, the compression's a little too this, and uh, uh, it's a little too bright in the 3K range, you know, stuff like that. And that's what I'm teaching the kids um, uh, how uh, what they're what to do. So we I've been doing that for the last 20 some years. And uh, in addition to my uh, work now, uh, my wife and I, Ulrika Schwartz, we've set up a, a company for about the last seven years, um, and uh, called Anderson Audio New York. And we, we, she is a, a very fine, <clears throat> she's an, a, re, a real tone meister, uh, you know, the real German degree. And so we, we, she's had 15 years of broadcast experience doing orchestras, both in stereo and surround and live, live broadcast. Uh, we thought let's let's put these two skills together, and so there are pro- there are times when my wife is actually my boss; she's my producer, <laughs> and then there are other times when I am the producer engineer, and she's my technical director. Um, so because she, um, uh, for example, she built a computer that would uh, record uh, sixty four tracks at uh, three hundred and eighty four kilohertz, you know, in, in DXD, and so we're we're working in super high resolution stuff and uh and it sounds amazing i mean i'm i once you start kind of moving up in this range um and uh, uh in fact i remember the first time this is now about three or four years ago we, we were out at skywalker mixing i opened up the fader on patricia barber's voice and i've been working with patty for 30 years and i opened it up and i i was gobsmacked i mean i just couldn't believe the quality that we had uh, coming off the track and um uh, and I said, okay, now I get it. I totally understand why we're doing this. Um, and it just sounded wonderful. And we've, uh, the last two records um, uh, have been done at uh, 352.8 kilohertz. And uh, and the last one was Grammy nominated in uh, the immersive uh, field. And it, it really is just a 5.1 recording. So it was competing against Christina Aguilera and Harry Styles mm. and all this, you know, real, Super blown out, uh, uh, immersive Dolby Atmos stuff, and there we are with the little five one, <laughs> which really is a good. It's really a good recording, uh, and and it just is solid. And part of that, I think, is because of the recording quality. So. Of course, yeah, that's amazing. I mean, all of that. You know, it, it's really interesting to hear your story because it, it all kind of stemmed from you just recording a rehearsal, which is which is amazing, right? And like, uh, I love. I love how you were diversifying your skills and just taking on whatever you can, whatever, you, whatever came your way. And I guess, you know, that that is kind of like the true nature of a freelancer. You have to kind of take on those opportunities. And you have to be adaptable. You have to just try on all new sorts, all, all new things that you maybe haven't done before. And, um, you know, it, it obviously has worked in your favor and it's led you to so many opportunities that, you know, now you're you're where you're at now because of all the hard work you put in. Right. Well, that's that's true. And, you know, part of it comes back to um uh you know at the time just trying to support a family and um you know I, I was constantly trying to get get jobs and do whatever would come along and and um, um there was a, a saying i'm trying to remember exactly what it said uh, one of our broadcasters susan Stamberg at npr had a three by five card that said something like uh, style is avoiding what you do badly and uh, and i always thought okay only take on what you're ready for and uh, so I know some of the jobs I took on eventually were actually pretty big and pretty, pretty high pressure. But knowing at that time I was ready for it, I could do it. And, yeah. uh, uh, you know, when you're especially, if, you know, here in New York City, when you're in a, when you're in a room with New York City brass players, you better be ready because mm-hmm. they're they're going to be gunning for you if you're not careful. And And back in the back in the 80s, you know, which was the kind of the tail end of. Uh, 
of the New York studio session player where, you know, they would be doing a jingle in the morning and an album at night and all that kind of thing. They were ready. And because they had worked with the best, you know, they had worked with, um, uh, the, they would have had Phil, Phil Ramon as their engineer and people like that. And, uh, you know, you're the new kid coming in. Uh, and you, you had to gain their trust. I mean, I can remember when, uh, you know, uh, I'd, I'd walk in the studio and Ron Carter would look at me like, Oh, Oh, it's you, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Or Jack DeJeanette, uh, you know, always had one particular tone he wanted to get out of his symbols. Um, and you know, and you, you start to, you start to get to know these guys and you start to recognize what it is they're trying for. Um, I mean, for example, there are some pianists, the way they play, you really want to be very structured in the, in the sounds that you get. You want to really, and I mean, structure, I mean, X, Y, type technique you know um somebody like a benny green who's very old school blue notey kind of thing and so the piano wants to sound very even somebody like a richie byrick you know a kind of much more ethereal kind of player you want something a little more gossamer something wider something bigger and so you have to have the, this kind of uh, menu of techniques and and uh, available at your fingertips and uh, know that this is the kind of sound that you want to get for this music and uh, so that's always been the thing. I mean, I know, you know, if I'm working with Ron Carter, here's my Ron Carter setup. Uh, if I'm working with Dave Holland, here's my Dave Holland setup. Um, you know, and um, uh, these, the, you know, the instruments all radiate differently. And you have to kind of put that in the back of your mind. Uh, you know, there's a there's a great book, Mike. I was, I was thinking about it. I should have a copy of it sitting right here. I probably do. You know, like the Jurgen Meyer uh, book on uh, how instruments radiate. You know, if I could recommend one book to people, it uh, it shows the radiation pattern of of how how a bassoon radiates. You know, where you know there's nothing. There's like nothing comes out of the top. It's all down here by the finger pad yeah. and all that. And and it really kind of guides you as to where to put the microphone. And uh, and so kind of studying that that kind of information. Um, you you know you can do that on your own. Um, and, um, I found a, I've, I've been reading that book and I would, uh, see, uh, uh, illustrations taken from that book. And finally, I think about 25 years ago, I found it, an English translation of it in, when I was in Berlin and, and it cost a hundred bucks. I said, I'm buying that book. So I have a copy mm. and, and I, I've used it at school, putting together little, uh, uh, portfolios and things like that to show, um, and then. The one thing, um, Alex Case, you're probably familiar with Alex and his book FX and uh, Mix Smart. Uh, Alex and I were talking about Jurgen Meyer one day, and we said, you know, we need to do an update. And uh, we started talking about the radiation of a guitar amplifier, and we worked with uh, our friend uh, from NYU, Agnieszka Roginska, and uh, we presented some papers at the AES showing uh, 3D models of how a, a typical Fender uh, deluxe, uh, radiates. And so you can find these on YouTube. If you, if you look up Fender, Fender twin deluxe and maybe put in my name or, and we had a, um, we had a graduate student actually put the numbers in and create a 3d model of, uh, of where you could put the mic and you could do all this kind of thing. And it's, it's just fascinating stuff. So we, yeah, we, we kind of applied our, um, academic, uh, credentials to this kind of thing and those papers i think are available on on aes uh, e-library too very cool yeah it's really interesting because you know when when you were kind of uh talking about your story and your background what what you do one thing that you mentioned was that you're a really big uh, you're really you're really big on teaching students the art of critically listening to to music and being able to identify those frequencies and stuff and you know i think this is a perfect example of why you need to learn this learn this stuff because your your job here is to help the artist reach their vision for their for their mm -hmm. songs, and so sure. like you said, like somebody might you know a drummer might want a certain frequency in their cymbals to come out, or the piano players may want a certain vibe with with their piano sounds. So it's like you have to be able to translate their instructions into the art of biking up equipment and getting getting that stuff to come out of the speakers. So you know I think that that there, there's there's certainly an art to that, and you know mm -hmm. it's it. it Helps you with the recording side of it. Helps you with the mixing side of it. All of that. You know, I've 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 talked to uh, psychologists and therapists, and I've told them about the job that we do. And more than one has said to me, you know, you're more of a psychotherapist than I am. <laughs> and you know, part of the yeah, exactly. Part of the job is 
maybe convincing the artist that, you know, what you really want is not what you want. Uh, really kind of follow me and stay with me and I'll show you eventually we'll get there. Um, and uh, uh, at the same time, you know, it's maybe it's the art of persuasion. Uh, maybe I need to persuade you or maybe you need to persuade me. You know, um, uh, David Baker, um, you know, I was in the studio with I was just observing him one day when uh, in my early days, he would come. He would say, come hang, hang down. I'm doing a, a Dave Liebman record. You want to come watch? I said, sure. You know, so and um, uh, somebody um you know, the, the, the bass player comes up with a really wacky idea. And I would look at David and say, well, that's a pretty stupid idea. And David says, you know, yeah, it's a stupid idea. But you know what? That might be a good idea. And I thought, okay, uh, let me let me re- kind of change my thinking about this kind of thing. So, you, you know, you sort of want to hope that uh, these ideas might be interesting. And at the same time, you know, you don't want to waste your time going down some some alley but you know at the same time you might discover something that you didn't know so there there are um, uh, <laughs> there are stupid questions and there are um sometimes not stupid questions you know it's that kind of thing mm-hmm. yeah it's very fascinating because you know I, I think that you don't want to just go into a recording blindly right like there's the, sure no. like as we as we become stronger as engineers we we learn our go-to things that we feel confident in but that in itself can produce its own sound, right? And and we have to be always working with the artists to figure out what they want. And also, you know, whether it's, you know, if someone's working on their own music or even you as a producer trying to come up with a vision for what this artist should sound like, you know, mm-hmm. it there's it's hard to quantify what that vision can sometimes be, right? And I think often we'll look at other records to be like, oh, I want it to sound like this. And maybe you dissect that process and how that, how that record was made. Um, right. But it, but it really does come down to that like critical listening of, you know, identifying what works for a song and you know where you can cherry pick an idea from this record and one from that record and 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 making it all come together. We were doing the what would what would be my second Patricia Barber album called Cafe Blue, and um, someone uh, the, the Cassandra Wilson Blue Light Till Dawn had come out about six months before that. And somebody said, that's what we want it to sound like. And so I gave the assistant some money. I said, go, go buy a copy. And, and you know what? That, that uh, CD sat on the console for the next five days. It was never opened. And, uh, and the album that we made uh, has become kind of an audiophile classic. And, you know, uh, this, the, so we, here we had an audiophile classic sitting there. And we, I, my feeling was we can do something equally as good. And, um, and that was the one, uh, and that was the other thing, you know, I, I said to the assistant, you know, I didn't travel to Chicago from New York, uh, you know, a couple of thousand miles just to make a record that sounded like everybody else's. I said, you know, looked around, so what can we do to make this a little bit different? And, um, uh, there was a, this stairwell at the Chicago recording company, perfect cement stairwell with cement stairs and the whole thing. And if you clapped your hands, it was like two and a half seconds. And I said, we have a live chamber sitting right here. Hmm. And, and I also noticed, I noticed the, uh, the, the assistant engineer was getting bored because, you know, it was, just, it was just kind of jazz and all this kind of thing. And I said, hey, here's what I want you to do. Let's get some speakers out in the, hall, in the stairwell. Get some microphones and let's build a live chamber. And so for the next three hours, I saw him kind of scurrying around and, you know, puttering away and all this kind of thing. And part of what uh, kind of made that record um, uh, <laughs> was frankly the overuse of uh, of some reverb <laughs> uh, because we had this amazing reverb that nobody else had. And then I think they eventually put some uh, put some tie lines out there, and, and other engineers started doing it. But we, I think, we were the first one. And uh, and then Sony a few albums later sent me the seven 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 reverb. So I have a convolution stick uh, of that of that stairwell amazing which, uh, <laughs> yeah which i i can still use if i have to i have a 777 down and down the basement um but um uh, uh but to me that's always the thing what can you do to make your record not sound like everybody else's uh you know and it could be building a live chamber you know we still do the same thing when we go to skywalker we use that sound stage as our reverb and we have slowly now over the, about the last five six years we haven't used any digital reverb at all we haven't used any percasti we haven't used any 
uh, lexicon or anything like that. We just use this big room and we mic it and that's our reverb. That's and, amazing. Um, yeah, yeah, it's great. I, I was very you know, curious we, about that because, because you know, like especially for a lot of jazz records, like the the ambience is such a big part of the recording, and you know, placing you in that that space with someone, and so yeah, I, I was curious to know if you were tracking that reverb live or if you were doing it in post. But it sounds like you're doing it generally live. It's all in post. Uh, you know, what we're trying to do is get good, clean tracks that then we can actually have a good good mix. Um, I am not a very good mixer in the box. Uh, I, I mean, I just know that. Um, I need to have faders under my fingers. And uh, so when we go to Skywalker, for example, we're mixing on the uh, on the big Neve VR um, and using the old uh, um, uh, automation that's there. And and it works just great. So, uh, and, and, and also I have everything right in front of me. I have all the EQs and any... You know, sends I have, I, I, it's all right there. So I can, I can work a lot faster. Uh, you know, when we were out there last May or March, um, I record, I mixed um, one project in stereo and surround, and then I mixed another project in immersive, and then I mixed another project in surround, and that was five days. We 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 walked out of there with roughly four or five projects, totally mixed, and that's just. Um, because, you know, we're sitting at this uh, big analog desk and just can work our little hearts out right there. So you'll typically kind of record things dry. And then, you know, in the case of like the reverb chamber or whatever, you'll just record that in post afterwards. And- very, very much so. Yeah. And, gotcha. um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to lean too much on the uh, on the recording room itself, unless we're, say, working in, in a concert hall in Norway, for example. I mean, uh, we've been working at the uh, Stavanger concert hall in Stavanger, Norway. This is an amazing room. Uh, it's got about two and a half seconds of reverb right there. Um, and um, in fact, I've got, I can, here's, here's our album right here. This is the one that, uh, that we do, the um, Ferndock uh, Symphonic Dances. And um, that was Grammy nominated in uh, Immersive. And, uh, and we actually, uh, you know, everybody talks about Decatree and Outriggers. And also, since we're working in immersive, we have about eleven microphones that are kind of supplying the the main uh, uh, thing, and we're trying to capture this room and really trying to get that. And then also spot micing most of the sections in the orchestra, so you end up with something like fifty two, sixty four microphones going down. And um, and then you know maybe you don't need them all when you mix. You just listen to it and say, okay, I can get it from here. But uh, but that's a that's an example of where we will actually kind of try to concentrate on getting a good sound and, you know, what does, what kind of uh, capture are we getting from the hall to gotcha. same time? Yeah. So it largely yeah. depends on the kind of project. If you, if you know, it's going to be immersive, then you're trying to use that room to take that yeah. space. Yeah. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I'm curious to know too, like when it comes to reverbs, obviously reverb is one of those things that it can make a recording sound really sweet and nice and, 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 you know, pl- place you in a nice space. But it also has the ability to make things sound very muddy. And, you know, if you oh, yeah. have the wrong reverb time or the wrong reverb, then, you know, things can get messy very quickly. So I'm curious mm-hmm. to know, how, what's your general approach to applying reverb to your tracks? Like, are you trying to um, find reverbs that generally kind of work in sync with the tempos of the songs? Um, and how, uh, when you're recording a live reverb or a chamber, like, you know, that stairwell, for example, you know, how mm-hmm. are you using that and making sure that that's going to fit and not just be you know, maybe too long for, for, for your music. Well, the one thing, you know, I, I like classic reverbs, you know, that's uh, like EMTs and things like that. And, you know, I worked at uh, Avatar for about 30 years and there we had, I think it was about, we had two live chambers and we had four EMTs and, uh, and essentially you would revert, you would reserve them because, you know, we had three or four other studios going after these things. And, um, there was one reverb that was kind of locked away at three, at like three and a half, almost four seconds. And it was just, you couldn't change it, <laughs> but it was such a good three and a half seconds. Um, you could even, in fact, sometimes on like a big band recording, I might just take, take it and turn it into mono and just go right down the middle and just tuck it behind uh, the soloist or something like that. And you might not even know it's, it's there. Um, but it really gave something to the uh, you know, to the the instrument that was uh, had the reverb on it, um, and then also at the same time using another EMT. Uh, you know, I kind of learned this from watching some of the some of the classic guys uh, when I first came to town. 
what they would do is they would set up two or three EMTs. Um, uh, some of my first sessions uh, were at a uh, you know, Phil Ramone's studio. And, and so the studio where uh, uh, Phoebe Snow would have recorded Poetry Man and, and uh, Billy Joel would have worked on Allentown. This, this little studio, R2, at uh, A&R's uh, 48th Street studio. Um, I remember the first time I sat down there, and it was a session I'm doing, and uh, and I put a sound into those EMTs. And first off, I my uh, I just I said I I know this sound. I've heard this sound on records now forever. <laughs> and uh, and and I remember I called my wife and said, "I am working in a real recording studio. I can't believe this. <laughs> you know, it's it, I, I'm now a real professional." And, and and part of it is just having the tools. And being in the right place. And, um, you know, it's sort of like you can't do it without having the tools. And so there I had, you know, uh, uh, EMTs that were obviously uh, uh, tricked out and tuned up by Phil Ramone. And that made my recordings sound, <laughs> you know, that much better. Um, and so that's part of the deal is, you know, especially here in New York, some of the classic rooms I've had the opportunity of working in, uh, Clinton recording that was another great studio to work in um and uh and then i i was in the progression of uh, power station to uh avatar and then um right track another great room to to mix in so when you're working in those kind of rooms you walk away with world-class sounds and so that's that's part of the deal and and now we work at skywalker again we walk we walk away with great sounds because we're in a great studio uh, you know so you kind of put yourself in that uh, position uh, there's also another thing is when you work in a room like this yes they are expensive but you know what as i said you know you can work so much faster and you can walk out of there with uh, you know a day or two of mixing you've got the album done you're not going to spend a week at a studio that maybe cost uh, a half of what the other one but you're going to spend the same amount of money eventually um and uh, so that's that's kind of how we started at that um as far as um you know we never really think of uh, a reverb that matches the tempo but we do think of a reverb that really is, is you know is, is it too long or too short and so uh, again what i was starting to t tell you was i uh, watched um uh, some of the some of the engineers setting up two or three different reverbs that had different times. And so you had, and, and then you would have also a pre-delay on front of these that might be different. And so you could set up, um, you would have something that might need a little, just a little poof of reverb. And then you need the, the lead might need something a little bit longer. And so you had two or three of these. You, I think maybe that's where a lot of people go wrong in that they try to get one reverb to do everything. And it really do, that really doesn't work out. Um, I would usually have easily a minimum of three different reverbs available to me, maybe even four or five or six. Uh, of, so, so I have them all in the console, and I can just dial into whatever I want at that moment. Um, and so fortunately, you know, in some of these rooms, you'd, you'd have three EMTs lined up and ready to go of different lengths. And then you might have it maybe uh, two machines from a, a Lex 480. And then you might have a couple of machines from a Brucasti or something like that. So when you set these things differently and you, you eventually find the one, you know, the, the one thing that I always found was is setting these up and listening to them and, um, and using pink noise to send into the reverb and then getting the balance set. And that was always, I think, a critical thing. And also, you know, you can tell, if the reverb is, uh, if if your uh, gain structure is set properly too, um, you know this this now this is now when you have to really kind of think. I'm an engineer at this point. You know, you're listening to gain structure, and uh, Ed Green taught us this up at Eastman, and he showed if you crank up uh, pink noise, and you hear it kind of almost like twist or turn in the frequency, you know something along the way is overdriving or something is underdriving, you know, so you can really kind of restructure your gain structure as you, as you go along. And that kind of thing is really very important. Um, in, in, um, uh, you're up in Toronto, you probably know Ed uh, Green's brother, Dave. He's, uh, uh, you know, they're both very, uh, famous, uh, uh, recording engineers. Dave did a lot of studio work in Toronto and, and Ed went out to LA and became, uh, 
uh, part of uh, a company called Green Crow, and I, and I worked with Ed on uh, some classic TV shows. Uh, I would always A2 for the, the Tonys uh, with Ed or the uh, Kennedy Center Awards. And Ed used to do the uh, the Grammys and the Oscars. Uh, and uh, like we were talking before we started, uh, we just came back from the Grammys and walking the the floor at the uh, uh, the Staples or what's now called the Crypto Center and uh, talking to some of the guys that were doing the show. And you'd say, you know, I used to work with Ed. And they go, oh, Ed, now there, <laughs> you know, all this stuff was being done by one guy. <laughs> it's now, you know, 15 engineers two music mixers and a production mixer and three house mixers and all this yeah. kind of thing. And it's, it's, it's crazy. But again, you know, these kind of experiences, you know, you can, you can always take these and, and you can also take it into your own life and, and move yourself forward like that. Yeah, that's very interesting. I've never heard the pink noise technique before with reverb, but it definitely, I, I understand it. Yeah. Well, you know, what you, what you do is you, you take, you take pink noise and you, you don't put it up on the board. You actually send it directly pre-fade into the reverb. I mean, and you can do this, you know, on in the box too. You can do it and send it pre-fade and just listen to it come back. And then you set your left and right balance. If you use a tone, it's going to do, it's going to warble and go back and forth and you can't really get anything steady. But pink noise is the way to kind of uh, check out your reverbs. And so you're primarily using that just more of a, more as a gain staging test. Gain stage and balance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's especially dealing with, with analog reverbs, you know, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Cause I, I do think that like, yeah, people tend to overdrive or underdrive their reverbs and also they pick the wrong reverbs, you know, and then mm -hmm. like it, it can definitely make a mix go kind of wonky. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting technique to, to find the right sound and make sure you've got all your mm -hmm. settings out and right. Yeah. It's very, very interesting. Yeah. I always, you know, reverb is one of those things that I, I frequently hear with a lot of my students is that like, you know, when they're, especially when they're just getting started, it's like reverb is that, that thing that you just throw on your mix to make it sound better, you know, <laughs> but it, but it, it can totally go the wrong way as well. And, and, uh, it can, and, and usually students will use too much. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's generally what I find is they really, they, you know, I, sort of like me and Cafe Blue, you, they go overboard, you know, you find this thing, you just slather it all over everything you got. Um, you know, but um, you want to be you want to be selective about it, um, and you want to and as you say, you want to take the uh, reverb and make sure it's the appropriate reverb for this tune, or maybe it's the appropriate reverb for this artist. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you listen to uh, Get Out of an Old Elvis Presley, I mean, that's just uh, that's like a tape slap into a live chamber kind of thing. Um, and um, and if you get out, uh, you know, Sinatra and Nat King Cole, that's Chamber Four at Capitol which is still there, you know, and, you know, and if you get the UA box, you know, that's been the nice thing about mixing at home. I've got the chap capital chambers sitting downstairs in the living room and I don't have to go to LA to, to just get the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the sound that I really want to want to have on some of my recordings. Yeah. And so that's, that's the, been the, that's been the best thing about the whole digital uh, uh, thing that, uh, you know, you can put in your house. For and, sure. Uh, that I, you know, Frank, I want to thank UA and, capital <laughs> for putting those <laughs> together those to me those are some of the best sounds we've got yeah i think the digital side of things has been a blessing and a curse when it comes to things like reverb because you know there's sure. it's i mean it's great yeah you don't have to go to capital to to record these things but um at the same time too like now there's just so many options available that it's easy to just have like option paralysis and you know just yeah you know i maybe just pick a preset because you know, that's something that gets you up and running really quickly but you know there is something to being in a studio environment that maybe has only one or two emts and you're like okay cool this is what this is what it is right i'm gonna work within my means sure. here well, my friend Steve Barber, who was responsible for uh, uh, creating the uh, the, the Lex uh, 480 sounds, uh, you know, he didn't want to have any presets at all. He wanted you to go in there and create whatever it is, you know. That's and that's why you had that that uh, the Lark with all the faders, and um, and so they eventually put presets, and then people would just go to you know a fat plate and dial down the top end, that kind of thing. Um, but um, uh, the one thing I always try to get my students to do is to uh, go to a space, do an IR, and put it in waves, and come up with your own reverb. Uh, you know, go to a go to a squash court and get a get a, a an impact. You know, and and those things are what uh, three four seconds. And and the thing is, you know, you can always dial it down. You know, you can't make it bigger than it really is, but you can always pull those things back. 
and uh, or you can go to a concert hall and uh, just get the sound of uh, uh, get an IR on these things, and you can you know you can do it on your you can do it on your phone or do it on your Zoom or something like that. And um, and and so that's the thing. It try you know how do you create a unique sound? Well, uh, and how do you make something that sounds like nobody else's? Um, and those are some of the ways you can do it: is creating your own reverb. Um, and 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 uh, you know, even the room I'm sitting in has its own particular sound, which doesn't sound like your room, you know. And so between the two of us, we have two unique sounds. Yeah, uh, yeah. For for people who might not understand IRs or maybe how to even create them, like how how would someone go about creating something like that? Uh, well, what you do is you take a, a recording device, and you would either take a clicker or a balloon, and you would you would uh, uh, pop it. And the thing is, you know, uh, uh, you don't want to uh, record it and you don't want to have a uh, distortion in the waveform. So you want to have a, a good recording of that pop. And then you would just very easily load it into waves. Um, and, um, uh, and then it will take that IR and turn that into a rever- reverb for you right there. Is there a specific plugin that, that you recommend for? Uh, pretty much. I mean, we've done it with waves, you know, okay. with the, uh, I'm trying to think of the, I think they, I think it is called like the IR convolutor yeah. or something like that, right? Like, exactly. It's just a convolution reverb. So, yeah. and most of the reverbs these days have that built in, and um, it's very simple to do. It's kind of, it's kind of fun to go out there. And in fact, it was one of the assignments I would give my advanced kids is to go out there and you know find a space. You get extra credit if you have your own reverb on this recording. So I love that. Yeah, it's uh, such a cool idea. And, and yeah, like you know, if you're trying to figure out how to w- how to make your recording sound unique record in a unique space capture that mm-hmm. unique environment that that makes a lot of sense there well exactly you know if you uh, there's and then there's other places like village recorder has a, <laughs> they have this um, main studio that has uh, the the size of a garage door that you can pull open and it's a live chamber that's actually in the room and so if you're cutting uh drums out there you can actually pull this door open and you can get this amazing chamber on on your drum track live if you want uh we were i was doing a record with uh, bob belden for capital and uh, and i had never seen this before and I, I believe this is where rumors was recorded this 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 one room um and they had built this thing in there it, uh, i hope it's still there um and so we put some microphones in the chamber and then we had the drummer just set right outside the chamber so we had this uh and you could kind of move the door open and close depending on how much you want to leak into the room um, and so spaces like that are, are really quite unique if, if you can find them. Uh, thinking about unique spaces, we, you know, we did the score for uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. And uh, that was a 60-piece orchestra. And that, that was months before the vaccine came out. So this is September of 2020. And we had a 60-piece orchestra socially distanced in this ballroom. And uh, so when, I, when, I, when my wife and I walked in and we looked at the setup, we went, holy crap! Look at this. Every every violinist was six feet apart from the next violinist, and all this kind of thing. <laughs> That's got to totally mess with your miking and everything, like everything you're used oh, to. Oh man! <laughs> oh, we, well, we you know we did, we did decatry, we did outriggers, we did all the stuff, and then we really we had to use a lot of spots, so we had made sure we had, we had sounds. And at the same time, what had happened was, you know, uh, we were sort of I was locked down in the control room and could not invade the space of the recording space we you know we were really covid compliant at that time and so my wife Ulrika was uh, was my person on the floor and so she was putting mics and making sure everything was ready to go and, and doing all that so i you know i had i had uh, you know first class talent as an assistant uh, and um, and so then uh, warner brothers won this mi- mixed in 7.1 and uh, so if you watch this movie you get the first sound you hear is this orchestra that we recorded and it's huge. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it's one of the projects that from the last couple of years that we're really proud of that most people don't realize that, you know, we're the ones that did it. And, uh, and it's an, it's unusual in that's a New York score, New York orchestra. And, and it was all the strings, all the orchestral string parts were recorded in one day. We had six hours to do this, roughly this entire score. Uh, and then we did some pickups at another at another studio, but we were at the Manhattan Center up in the ballroom doing that. But again, there we had this amazing space to work with and capture. Mm-hmm. So 
Yeah, it makes sense. If, I mean, if you've got that, you utilize it and it just helps with the creative process. And yeah, it mm-hmm. also seems like it also seems like you're the kind of person who does really well with limitations. I mean, you were, you were talking about recording with like two track recording and, you know, and, and I'm sure at that time, too, back then, like there was there was the option. There was the there was the opportunity to record with more tracks. But when you had that limitation, I'm sure it forces you to think more creatively and, and be sure. more strategic with your miking and all that stuff. And so, well, there's, you know, and, and there's some pr- some producers that really know that's when you kind of call somebody like me um, to come into your project. Uh, Michael Cascuna, uh, who I've known for easily 40 years, Michael is a uh, his thing now is mostly mosaic records and, and re-releases and things like that. But um, I met Michael in the seventies. Our first concert was like an Ella Fitzgerald concert that we were doing. And um, we were flying. This is about 10 years ago. We were going to uh, Poland. We were going to Warsaw. Uh, to record a uh, uh, the uh, Warsaw Symphonia with uh, James Carter was playing sax. It was a um, uh, concerto that had been written for him. And again, we had one day to record this 30-minute piece with a, a full orchestra and all this kind of thing. And this is back when, you know, we're going to Warsaw in the middle of December. Um, and, you know, there's no Radio Shack. There's no Staples Center. There's nothing. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of said to Michael, I said, um, I have to take drives. And that's when he, he said, when I started thinking in those kind of specific terms, because, you know, we're showing up on a Monday morning and we're going to start recording. What do we have? Um, and he said, oh, you'll have to get out your old NPR chops, won't you? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and he, you know, he knew me from those days and he knew, okay, this is kind of guerrilla recording. Um, in that, we had... We could only record 16 tracks. Uh, we had, uh, I think, 32 lines coming up from the hall, but it had to be summed down to 16 and, uh, and live. You know? And so I had to do submixes of all the woodwinds, all the brass, all the strings, all the thing, and then have orchestra uh, left, center, right available, too, at the same time. So I had to think, really, how, how am I going to dial this down to 16 tracks uh, live, and can I... Can I just walk in there Monday morning and look at the studio and go, okay, here we go. And it's that kind of, you know, um, 30 years of New York studios. Uh, because again, um, this is another thing that a lot of people have not had the experience of doing. Coming out of the 70s into the 80s, you had all these major recording consoles being made and studios constantly replacing the recording consoles. And so, you know, you might walk in and there's a, a brand new SSL E series sitting there, or there's a brand new SSL G, or there's a new K, or there's, a, you know, uh, or a J, or, or there's a brand new Neve sitting in front of me. And we used to go to the AES convention, and I would book time with the guy from SSL, and I would say, I have a session on Monday teach me the console. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, that's how I learned a lot of these consoles. Um, and then, uh, you know, you just learn the automation by sitting and mixing something and, and, you know, you've got a client over your shoulder and you're trying to actually not, um, uh, take a lot of time on this mix because you don't know the automation. I mean, it's, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it, it was, it was a lot of pressure growing up and a lot of quick learning. Um, and, uh, and so now having, sort of all those consoles under your fingers, you can kind of walk in and kind of kind of uh, access any situation that you're presented with. Yeah. Um, and, and so for students, it's, um, it's kind of an experience. Uh, I even say, you know, at uh, back at NYU, we have an amazing faculty. I mean, you know, we've got people like Kevin Killen and Nick Sansano and um, uh, Bob Power. You know, there's, that's a real wor- world of uh, experience. And, uh, you know, for some of us, it's, it's almost difficult to teach because it's so natural what we do. And we've been doing it for so long. We've, we passed the 10,000 hour thing, you know, years ago. And, um, uh, and so I, for us, it's just, you just sit down and you do it. You know, if, if I was talking to anybody about, uh, what to do is, you know, all I can say is make it sound like music. Um, and that is, you know, it's not an engineering exercise. It's really a musical experience that you're trying to create. That the, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. I, you know, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, that's what it has to be because nobody cares what went into it. I remember no. one of I remember one of my early mentors who was a he he was a Grammy award winning uh, engineer, and he he said the same thing to me. He's like, 
like at the end of the day, you need it to sound like music and you can mm-hmm. learn all the rules and whatever about, about engineering, but you know, you can easily get lost in that stuff too and start to take away from the energy and from the feeling of the music. And, you know, it's like at the end of the day, it just has to be good. And that's all that the listeners care about. Sure. And in, in the end, nobody cares what the budget was, you know, mm-hmm. that it really doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, and so they, they don't care if you had a lot of money, or you had a little money. They just want to hear what's it sound like. Uh, if you can, and, and they don't care how long it took you to mix it either. You know? mm-hmm. um, yeah, when I walk into a studio the, the next morning, you know, I really don't care, uh, you know, what, what you were doing the night before. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't care if you walked out of there at, you know, five in the morning. Here we are, it's 9 a.m. I, you know, I was thinking like uh, what Disney used to say about Disneyland. You know, every morning is opening day. And uh, so, you know, for everybody who walks in there, they don't care what happened yesterday. And, and, you know, you're looking down, you don't want to see anything from yesterday. You want to see today. And uh, you want to be treated like I'm the star. Um, There was was one uh, up-and-coming engineer at the time, John Sickett. Um, I would walk into the control or the studio. And, you know, they'd be doing setup and music would be playing like, and it was great. And I would say, turn it off. And they'd look at me like, what are you doing? I said, you know, when my artist comes in, uh, they, they, don't, they don't want to hear the latest and greatest. They, they are the latest and greatest. And at the same time, I don't want something taking me out of my head of what I've got in mind. Um, and so uh, a couple of years later, I was, at, uh, I was at Power Station. And John was actually, I was in Studio A and John Sickett is in Studio B. And John came up to me and said, you know, that that advice about not playing music before a session, he said, that's the best advice you ever gave me. And uh, uh, he just looked and said, thanks a lot for making me do that. And so there are things like that. You know, you're trying to set up an environment uh, for a performer. Um, And, you know, you know, the album you're playing could be (laughs) could be this artist's arch enemy I mean, you know, and there and there, you've just put a damper on the session that you know you're going to spend six eight hours and this poor artist is just, you know you have to be really careful with things like you even have to be careful about you know you can't compare you uh, you know if, if you do a playback you can't say oh wow that just sounds that sounds just like the new cindy lauper album <laughs> pick pick name of artist you can't do that because who knows what what had gone down, like even the night before at the Grammys between, you know, Taylor Swift and X person, you know, yeah. uh, you have to, you have to be very careful about those kinds of things. Again, this goes back to the psychology thing. It's great advice. It's something that so many people just overlook because you, mm. you, you, you do that kind of thing innocently, but, but you don't realize the repercussions that can actually happen as a result. I have done it myself. Uh, you know, I mean, you have to, you have to kind of burn yourself at some point. To know, oh, I should I should not have said that. <laughs> yeah, you know, once once there's a conversation between, the, say, the artist and the producer going on, uh, if you're going to step into there, uh, you better be ready and you better be right. Um, uh, and uh, because uh, uh, you you can't back out of it. And uh, uh, so there there have been times, and you and you you say something you realize no you know the the other thing is also again i'm talking big studio things is you know if you have a talk back you have to be very aware of who's got control of the talk back because if that mic comes open that mic is just open from this room to that room and anything that's said which could be just innocently about something else you know you, you could be talking about lunch for all you know and it just gets misinterpreted and you have just blown up the session um you know, and uh, I mean, I, NPR, I remember somebody hit, had a button open and I said something, the artist came back and it was, uh, that's when I said, oh, I have to be very careful with this kind of stuff. And, you know, we, you do try to warn people, but you don't, you don't know it until it happens to you. Yeah. Uh, reason and logic are, t- are two things that just like don't <laughs> exist in the studio. You know, <laughs> It's like when we're dealing with artistic people, we're dealing with like a lot of sensitive people and they're you know especially when it comes to singers and stuff like that who are like revealing their emotions and their lyrics and all that sort of thing it's like very easy to set someone off at that point you know you may not be the most important person in the room and you have to be able to kind of be willing to take that on and let them uh you know uh, uh be the 
the star basically i mean you know you're 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 supporting them uh in your your talents and your efforts um and um uh, so it's all that. And then on top of that, then, you know, you know, at the same time, you want to make sure you get credit. You want to make sure that uh, you get paid and, you know, there's all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, the other thing is, you know, who has rights, who gets points, uh, who has the copyright, um, you know, there's all these, again, this is the kind of thing you need to learn. It's unless you're just going to be, you know, another schlub work at work for hire kind of thing. Which is frankly no fun at all. You you really do want to participate creatively, if you can, and um, and also maybe even financially if you can too. Of course, absolutely. Well, I'd love to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about recording specific instruments because you you do record a lot of jazz and acoustic based music, mm-hmm. and within those genres, there's a lot of instruments that we don't frequently talk about on this podcast a lot because a lot of people listening to this are typically working on like the typical rock instruments, guitar, bass, drums, and that kind of stuff. But there are other people that, you know, play other genres of music. And I'd love to talk mm-hmm. about some different uh, instruments. And um, one that I'd love to start with that is a big part of a lot of the recordings you work on is piano. Um, sure. and I'm, and I'm curious to know, you, I mean, you had mentioned earlier that there's different approaches to, you know, where you might position your microphones to get a specific sound. So what are some of your tips for recording piano and getting a really good, clean, balanced sound? Sure. Well, the, the one thing I do, which is really unusual, um, and I, I got this from watching a uh, classical recording session, um, is I will either take, I have a stick, oversized stick, and I'll take the lid and, you know, the large stick for a piano is usually about like this. My my piano lid is usually up about like that, which would be, what, 80 degrees or something like that, 75 degrees rather than 45. And you get a lot more real estate to work with. And also it kind of takes this this kind of sound away from the piano. And um, so that's the first thing I do. I, I, I will, if I don't have my stick with me, I'll do it with a uh, music stand. Or, or a, a microphone stand and really kind of wedge it in and, and get it up there and make sure it's real snug. I've never had one fall on me yet. Um, but, uh, but that, that to me is like the first thing I do. And um, just opening up the piano, it's such a small thing. <laughs> opening up the piano and getting it, getting it just really letting it breathe a lot more. Um, and then, um, and then listening to the piano, you know, because uh, uh, the one thing I've noticed is uh, a Steinway radiates different from a Fazioli, radiates different from a Baldwin. And you really have to kind of stand there, listen to the pianist, and um, try to imagine where you're hearing the sounds radiate, both the top and the bottom. And sort of that's where I put the microphones, you know, that kind of thing. The other thing is uh, uh, Tom Lazarus, another classical engineer, said to me, you know, if you reach under the piano, there's a beam that kind of is like center where the, where the turn of the piano is. There's a beam that kind of goes, and that shows you the center divide of the piano. So if you reach down and feel where that beam is, then you come up and you go left, right. That'll show you where, if you're micing, say, an AB, if you want a classical AB, that's that's how you find it right there. There's a Schubertian kind of micing that the classical people always talk about, which is putting one down by the tail, uh, a mic down, down, by the, down by the real foot of the piano. And uh, that is... Um, in Europe, very much known as um, a technique for for certain kinds of music, uh, like um, leader and things like that. Um, you know, the question is, what I'll do is I'll usually do a couple of kind of wide omnis, and then I might put an X Y in the middle, so I have a choice. Because if you know, if I have a tune that really wants the structure, or if I have uh, something that wants the texture, I have the two different uh, palettes available to me on on, on the console. So I'll usually try to get a couple of different things. Um, somebody, I, I work a lot with uh, Gonzalo Rubicaba, and um, um, I would find that, I mean, he wants, he wants really nice even because he's up and down the instrument. He wants a really no, no, nothing poking out. So I I've, I've found, and he's also using a really big uh, piano, like a, and uh, uh, extra large with extra strings, you know, the extra eight notes down at the bottom and all that kind of thing. So it's, it's a huge instrument. And uh, we did a solo album, and I found, uh, I think I used five or six omnis between in and out, and then also some getting the room. And then at the same time, this was almost 20 years ago. At, the, at that time, I was even recording the room thinking, okay, if we wanted to do something surround or immersive, I would have something even further into the room to do. Um, yeah, I, you know, that's sort of the thing. Uh, the other uh, you know, <laughs> the old Van Gelder trick, 
if you want to get that Rudy Van Gelder sound is you take a couple of KM84s and you and you put them in one hole down and one hole in, you know, two holes in and point them right down at the soundboard. You get this amazingly even sound. I was doing a, a Benny Green record and I had taken those two p- particular microphones and I had just sent them to the drummer's headphones. And I saw the drummer walking past the piano and he was looking because there's mics down here and there's mics over here and mics over there. And Victor Lewis was the drummer and he looked and said, and I said, he saw the mics in the soundboard and I, and I came on the talk back and I said, that's what you're hearing. <laughs> he said, somebody has copped Rudy Van Gelder's shit. <laughs> 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 and I said, yeah, I was giving you the Rudy Van Gelder's. He said, it sounded just as if I was at Van Gelder's studio. <laughs> and um, so I, you know, I, I always had fun with Victor in the studio. So I would do things like that. You know, and he would be listening going, why, why, why is that? There, there were one time we were, um, uh, you know, I'm getting off topic here, but um, um, uh, there was a, a, a basketball final going on. And so uh, I would, to like Victor Lewis's headphones, I would just send the basketball game. So he would be playing and listening to the game at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, whatever keeps people inspired in the studio, right? <laughs> well, you know what? And, and you, you have fun. And as long as, you know, nobody gets hurt and you're not screwing up the session, you know, it does get printed somewhere. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and Victor would always remember we had a great time in the studio. You were, you know, <laughs> so. very cool. Uh, I'm curious to know, like, so you were, you were talking about how you like to use Omni mics with, with the piano. Um, I do. Yeah. And, and I'm curious to know why Omni, as opposed to like uh, maybe a cardioid pattern where it's pointing more just at the strings on the, well, you know, it's, I'm, I'm really trying to catch the radiation of the instrument. Also, you know, uh, the cardioids, you have to build in so many uh, compromises to the microphone itself to get that focus on the sound. And I found that, um, I, I mean, I, my, my DPAs are actually B and Ks. That's how old they are. So I, uh, I'll take my like 4007s or 4006s uh, or my Bronner VM12 microphones. I've just found I like the sound of those things in Omni better than, uh, than card. And also, you know, you can get in closer with an Omni than you can with a card because sure. the Omni sounds like it's back about six inches than the card does. So, you know, you can actually kind of get in tighter and get really closer sounds with when you're in omnidirectional patterns. Cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what about with like compression on piano when you're when you're in the mixing stage? Do you ever do it or is it mainly just you're focusing with the, with the mics and, and getting it balanced that way? Only, only if necessary. Um, you know, most of my players are pretty controlled and pretty... Um, uh, 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 they don't need that kind of clamping down. Uh, unless it's kind of a, a a pop thing that we're going for, um, it, it it it's really genre specific. You know, mm-hmm. if we need something that's like, you know like an Elton John kind of sound, we'll go for that. Uh, something with a real tight uh, EQ and a very tight uh, compression. Um, most of the stuff I'm looking for is, has some breadth and has some space, um, and. Um, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll lean more in the direction of letting, uh, you know, a good mastering engineer, uh, uh, apply uh, a nice compression overall, you know, so, uh, because, you know, some Bob Ludwig always has a better compressor than I have in the, in the studio. So I'm, I'm very happy to say here, Bob, you take care of that. Yeah. But I think you brought up a good point there too, that it's sometimes it's a matter of like the, it's, it's really about the arrangement in the song, um, and the instrumentation because you need that space. And like, if it's a song that has that space, then yeah, like why clamp down on it? You know? So that, that makes a lot of sense. Well, at the same time, you know, you want to make sure in your miking, you know, that you say leave space for the vocal or the soloist. And so that's another reason why you might want to use some spaced omnis. And then you have that just ever so slight little hole in the middle, you know, between the two. If, if you, you know, if you do an X, Y and you just cover the center, you're going to have to put something on top of that. And, um, and, and that might be your vocalist or your saxophonist or whatever. And, you know, again, you're, you're creating problems for yourself. So if you think about what it is you're recording and your microphone technique, then you can kind of place these things where they need to be. And you've, you've kind of created the mix before you even made the mix. I love that. That it's like intentional miking. You know, it's, it's yeah. yeah that, that's that makes a lot of sense. Um, mm-hmm. Another instrument that I'd love to chat about too is horns, because that's something that we don't talk a lot about on this either. Um, sure. So when it comes to recording horn sections, like do you have any go to setups for that? 
Sure. Um, you know, it, it, and again, it, it depends on the genre and it depends on the horn players and it depends on the horns. Um, there are times when you might want uh, a kind of a condenser, a real punchy kind of sound. Um, and so you might want to do that. There are times when you might want to go all ribbons. And so because, you know, if I've got, um, uh, oh, for example, I had a, a, a J.J. Johnson project where I had I had trombone section and 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 trumpet section and uh, you know French horns and euphoniums and all this kind of thing, but at the same time I had to put an I had to put a single solo trombone on top of that, um, and so the choice here was to how do I differentiate a trombone from trombones? So what I did was I had my trombone section all mic'd with uh, Sankin CU forty one condenser microphones, and then I had my soloist with an RCA seventy uh, seven. So I've got JJ, who has a, a classic uh, 50s trombone sound. I want to have it kind of round and, and uh, full and all that kind of thing. Um, and then I've got, this, I've got this New York brass section. You know, like my, my, I think my first or second trombonist is the principal of the New York Philharmonic. You know, hmm. they, these are amazing players. And they're going to be playing backgrounds. And so I want something with a little bit of bite and all that. So I've got... So I, I have condensers back here, and I've got a ribbon there. But I've got now trumpets that are going to be bright right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put ribbons on those guys. And so I've already got tailored off the, the edge of the, of the trumpet. So they can actually blend nicely with the trombones, all that kind of thing. So uh, the choice of microphone, I think, is really the most important thing you want to do. Uh, you know, how, are you, how, do you, how do you want this horn section to actually kind of play in the mix? Do you want it uh, round and full, or, or do you want it kind of bite, bitey? Um, you know, I I tend not to use uh, dynamics on horns. Um, I think that's to me that's really kind of a PA kind of thing. But um, because I think in in the recording studio, I think you want to get something a little nicer than that. Um, and uh, but you know, you could use four twenty ones or four 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 forty ones or. Uh, uh, you know, some good dynamics, um, some of the buyers like 88s and things like that. Those are also good too. But I, I tend to, uh, my choices usually go between ribbons and condensers. Yep. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And and as you're talking about it, it really, you know, you're, you're essentially creating depth in your mixes just through microphone selection. And exactly. You know, I love what you had to say there about, you know, maybe using the ribbons on the trumpets or whatever to, to roll off the edge and, and make those sit a little mm -hmm. further back. Like, it's it's so smart. It's like so many people just think, oh, this this is the go to mic for that instrument, and it's like, no, well, there's other, there's <laughs> yeah. all these other choices out there that can kind of pre EQ your mix for you and and make it much easier. Well, exactly. You know, we had uh, I was I was doing a record with uh, it was a Horace Silver record that uh, Michael Brecker was uh, the saxophonist, and Mike Mike said to me, you know, uh, what what have you been doing? And I said, well, yesterday I had Joe Henderson. He said, what do you use on Joe? And I said, a uh, Sankin forty one. Now J Joe played ever so soft i mean he just breathed into the horn so the mic the, the mic pre every the whole mic chain was not stressed at all and mike said you know you know i play a little harder than than joe i said yeah um he said so what do you think and i said well let me i got out of Cole's 4038 and uh and i put that up and he played it and bang that was exactly the sound he was looking for hmm. um and you know because part of the reason I started drifting into ribbons is I would use, uh, uh, you know, a U4, an old classic U47, you know, the, the mic that you would expect would be the warmest and browned. Huh? And these guys would come in, you know, Joe Lovano, they would look and go, why, why is it so bright? Why is it so harsh? And I'm saying, well, you know, this is, this is about as warm and as, as, as it's going to get. <laughs> and so, so I started thinking, okay, forget the, forget the classic tube thing. Let's let's try something else, and that's when I started using a forty thirty eights or a DX seventy seven or something like that. That was in that was in uh, good shape. So I I always tried to have microphones that the studio might not buy because the studios would always buy U eighty sevens and four twenty ones and things like that. Uh, but they weren't going to buy you know DPA or B and K, and they weren't going to buy Sankin and. Uh, because I remember one time I was I was at uh, Avatar, and they were saying Eric is upstairs and has the forty seven, and you know so it's you know, and Eric is obviously Eric, and so um, you know uh, uh, 
So uh, I thought, okay, I, you know, I'm not working with Eric Clapton, so I don't get the 47 today. Um, so that's when I start thinking, I need to have whatever I need, and I'm going to make sure it's stuff that they're not going to have. So I would walk in with two or three cases, now four or five, of microphones, of stuff that's specific to me. And I don't have to worry about who's in the next room. And um, so that has that has worked out. So we have, <laughs> just around the corner here, we have really quite a collection of microphones. Just That's amazing. Sitting sitting back here. Oh, yeah. that's great advice. It, it, it's so true. It's like all the studios have the stables, but it's it's those other things that give you that flexibility and that, that really separate your, your recordings from others. So um, Exactly. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a really cool uh, way of looking at it because yeah, it's like why why bother buying the same things that the studios already have? Like you know, you, you're never going to use it. <laughs> exactly, and you know, and you don't need uh, you don't need a lot of them. You just need a few. Um, you know, uh, and and the thing is, you need to find out what is, what is it that you like. Um, you know, I've I've come away listening to these uh, these Sankin CU 41s I love the sound of these things. I mean, the, to me, that's my fifty seven. Um, I'll, I can just about put it on almost anything that works great on piano. sounds good on, if, if a trumpet player is not playing really hard, it sounds great. Saxophone is wonderful. Uh, piano, bass, um, almost, almost anything. Uh, guitar, that is a wonderful acoustic guitar mic and a pair of them in XY right across the player is doing this. And I'm kind of, I've got a really weird angle. But you know what? That X Y right across the instrument, it just fills out the track like crazy. Yeah. And uh, and uh, and so that's uh, there's a Pedro uh, Pedro Martinez or Pedrito Martinez album that I did, uh, Rumba de la Isla, which is like uh, to me, it's a, a textbook in how to do Latin music, but also make it just make great hi fi sounds um, and. Uh, uh, and using just anything that we could uh, do, but also, but also using a lot of stereo. You know, we don't we we do some things in mono, but also a lot of like little ABs or MS or XY and things like that. Trying to really capture these sounds and and having some depth and space available to us. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, another instrument I'd love to ask about is upright bass. Like, what's your go to setup for that? I can tell you, a long time ago, I was uh, working at again back at A and R. And um, I started setting up uh, a couple of microphones on the bass, like a kind of a left and a right, and um, uh, and a DI. And I start. I was watching the meters. I would see the left meter would do one thing. I'd see one note come out over here, and I'd see another note come out over here, and I'd see another note come up off the DI. And I'm thinking, just not one position is going to work. And uh, so I started thinking, well, okay, what can we do about that? Um, and you know. I started recording actually bass in XY, so I could ac- actually have an in- have a microphone that would kind of look across the instrument. Now you know I could collapse it very nicely to mono if I needed just something right down the middle, or I could actually give it some space. And uh, and also um, I have a couple of tube DIs that have a very high input impedance. So a lot of criticism that's been about the uh, using the direct on the bass is people using the wrong kind of DI that loads the pickup and, and changes the frequency response of the, of the pickup. So um, with this uh, tube DI, uh, I've gotten always a very nice kind of DI sound. And again, I don't lean on it very heavily all, at all. It's just there to kind of support. I could take it away. You wouldn't miss it, but it, but it's nice to have it there because there are just a little bit more sustain and a little more, uh, there might be a note that's there that's not acoustically coming out. Um, and so I, I find that, and then I started adding, uh, working with Ron Carter, I started adding a, a dynamic mic just above it. Um, I have an old uh, EV, what's it called? A six, six, four, three or something like that, you know, something 50 years old. Uh, but 57 is perfectly fine. Um, but something to just get a little bit of meat and just put it right down the middle. And then having that available in, especially when we're working in surround or immersive, is I can put the bass in the phantom and then I can put that little, uh, that 57 and the DI in the center channel. So I can actually get a very interesting kind of bass, 3D bass sound kind of happening. So that, I love that. That's a cool approach because, you know, most people just think of it as bass is mono and that's all it needs to be and mm-hmm. all it should be but but yeah i mean it makes sense if you're doing the immersive stuff you can spread it out a little bit more or even in stereo you can get a little bit more spread 
Well, you know, wh- why are there why are there two holes? On, why is there a hole on this side of the base and why is there a hole on that side of the base? It's got to be radiating something, you know. Um, and also, uh, the height is the important thing. You know, if you're too high and you're, you're, you'll get too much in the way of fingers, and if you're too low, it's just mud. And so you want to find, again, it's like listening to the piano. You go out and listen to the player and you try to, you know, you can see where their sound is focused and you can just put the mic right where it is where you hear it. Yep, makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, the last thing I'd love to ask you about is uh, in relation to drums. And, and we talk about drums a lot on this podcast, but one thing I know a lot mm-hmm. of jazz guys love to do is they love to, a lot of people like to record drums in mono. I'm not sure if, mm-hmm. is that something you do a lot of? Um, <laughs> only as an experiment in school to show kids what, what uh, you can do. Okay. And, but at the same time, though, I have been impressed with what we've been able to do with, say, three microphones. Um, and the coverage that we get, it's just, it's amazing. Um, I, again, I got this, uh, from Alex case at, uh, UMass Lowell. It was a thing where he, uh, uh, showed me, uh, that he was doing, it was called recording Ringo. And he would try to imitate Ringo's drum sound and style throughout the years. And a friend of mine, Don Wirschbach, who used to be in charge of, uh, uh, North American SSL is also a mic collector. And he would come in with, uh, AKG D 23s and D 19s and things like that. And we would actually have those classic microphones that they would have used. And we would try to imitate the sounds that Ringo would have. So there might be, uh, you know, a kick mic, a snare mic and one overhead, or we might replace that overhead with a 4038 or something like that. Um, I what I tend to do is I do a combination of I do like an MS overhead and then I do a pair of wide um uh cardioids and um and then what that does is uh, in the latest um uh, uh, our latest Grammy nomination the Jane Ira Bloom uh, picturing the visible I could take the MS and put it in the back and I could take the pair of wide cards and put them in the front and what you get is this sort of almost like a lid on top of the mix. And you feel like there's height in the mm-hmm. mix, but there's it's really just the balance of the front left and right to the back. And Allison Miller opens up with some little bells that she does. And what she's doing is she's between this microphone and these microphones. But since I've taken this one, I've put it way in the back, the, it now floats up in front of you, all this kind of thing. It's really cool. Very interesting. Um, yeah, so you can, th- that's the other thing for getting extra dimensions in your uh, in your miking. You know, you don't have to use it, but if you have it, you can play with this stuff and uh, can, can uh, kind of pull and stretch and kind of make other sounds happening. So we end up with this drum kit that really kind of fills the room. Um, we did that again with uh, Jane R. Bloom's uh, Early Americans. That was our that was our Grammy winner for Surround in 2018, and it's just a trio. It's just drum, bass, and sax. And uh, the best part is we beat Kraftwerk that year um, for a best best Surround album. Uh, but it's just a trio. But it's a very convincing trio. It's full and it's big, um, and it's clean. And you're just sitting in the middle of this uh, this drum kit, which is just I love it. You're so in, you're so intentional with your mic positions. It's amazing. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's all you got, um, uh, you know, especially when you're, when you're mixing, if you haven't done it, you're, you're stuck, you, you're yeah. stuck with whatever you did. Yeah. So if, you know, you can put a few more things out there, you could have a lot more fun for sure. Uh, when it comes to mixing. Absolutely. Well, that, the reason why I was asking about the drums is just cause I, I know that a lot of people in, especially in the jazz scene, like to do a little bit more of a minimalist approach to, to drums as opposed to spot micing everything. I would, I would disagree with that. Uh, yeah. you know, most of the guys, um, that I know, um, they are they are imitating kind of a, a rock miking. Interesting. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a mic per drum because you know if again if the drummer comes in and says I want more floor tom, and you don't have a mic sitting over there, yeah, you, there's nothing you can do. So um, in fact, in the jazz world, we'll cover uh, the hardest thing, frankly, in the, in the jazz world is is this double headed bass drum. Um, and so I found something in the front and something in the back. And then you have to uh, obviously reverse the polarity of the back microphone to match the front. But if you don't have that little attack coming from the beater in, in the front, you you won't have enough attack. And, and uh, so things like that. But I the other thing I do is in my drum kit is, again, I'm using omnis on like the snare and the, the toms. And so, in fact, all I would say 
just about 100% of my mics, they're all condensers. I don't use any dynamics on the drum kit. Uh, uh, I, I was doing a Max Roach live radio broadcast um, years ago. And, uh, and I said to the guy that was supplying the, the, the gear, I said, okay, uh, uh, 57 on the snare. He said, I don't have any 57. So I don't, you know, I don't have. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay. Uh, and I knew that a 4007 had, could take the SPL of a snare. And I said, you got, you have like a 4007. He said, yeah. And we put that out. Max played the snare. And I thought, holy crap, this is like everything I've ever had to dial in. <laughs> to a 57 to make it sound like a snare and it's right there at the mic i mean i didn't have to do a darn thing and again it's it's close but you know it's that, got that omni that sounds like it's back a little bit um and it's also got here's the thing about all this is i'm looking for good leakage i know i i'm gonna have leakage uh, and you know that's you were asking about cardioids the cardioids tend to give you what i would call bad leakage and so I'm always looking for a cardio that gives me good leakage, and the Omni is going to be excellent leakage. And so I'm not worried about you know a little bit of hi hats in my snare um, because it's going to sound good. But I'll also have something over there to cover that too. Um, but I tend to use like a 4007 uh, on the snare toms, things like that. You know. But again, it's that is to me very genre specific. You can't do it. With, uh, you know, if you're looking for power and rock, it's going to sound dumb. It's just going to sound stupid. Um, and so you have to be, you have to, but in jazz, especially if you're looking for the detail of brushes on the snare, um, the, a, a good condenser like a 4007, you can really hear like each like little bit of the brush kind of going around and just going on the snare. Um, that's the kind of detail I'm looking for. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. And, and it's, uh, you know, that part of the reason why I asked this question was because I was curious to know your techniques. And it sounds like you are doing things that are very different than the typical rock way of, you know, 57. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, very, very unique. And, you know, I, I was also curious because, um, oh, yeah, at least a lot of the guys that I know that are recording jazz are doing pretty minimalist setups. And, and I always thought, like, oh, isn't that like, you know, when you get into the mix, what happens when someone wants more of the, the kick or the stare or whatever, right? Like you're kind sure. of painting yourself in a corner with that. So um, it's interesting to hear that you are you are kind of taking more of a rock approach so, so to speak, uh, you know, by close micing mm -hmm. everything, but but you're you're adding your own jazz spin to it by having all the omnis and the condensers and. Um, sure, you know the other thing you can do is also, I mean, the the other mic I've always found for overheads is like the Bayer 160 ribbon. That's a that's a wonderful overhead, and you can kind of set that up in like an ORTF form, and so that's a, that's another kind of stereo that you can get. And and again, the the other thing is, you know, these stereos that are sitting above the kit. They're actually telling you where the snare is going to be in the in the mix. The snare is not going to be down the middle. It's going to be slightly off to the off to one side or the other, depending on where it is, because so that true. stereo is really um, uh, carving out where all the instruments are going to be. So you want to listen to the overheads and say, "Okay, there's okay, there's the snare," and then you reinforce it. That's that's what you're doing all the time. That makes uh, you know, I know uh, uh, I know a lot of. Uh, musicians or producers might say, I want that snare down the middle. And you say, well, I'm going to end up with a snare that's dead center and I'm going to end up with a ghost of that snare off <laughs> on the side. I don't think we want to do that. So yeah, absolutely. And then you have to show them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jim, we, we've we've gone on way longer than I anticipated we would go. So uh, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but uh, if people want to learn more about you, maybe even potentially work with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Oh, um, we have a website. It's AndersonAudioNewYork.com. And uh, you can find out um, everything about us. Um, uh, contact details are there. There's a discography. There's press releases and uh, all kinds of things like that. Um, so it's just a straight old Anderson Audio New York dot com, and you'll find us right there. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for for doing this. I really appreciate it, and uh, I know that people are going to learn a lot of this, a lot of great stuff from this, because we've definitely covered a lot of ground that uh, we haven't talked about on the podcast before. So uh, thanks again for for doing this. Oh, wonderful! Thanks for inviting me, Mike. It's been great. So that was my interview with Jim Anderson, and I really enjoyed that episode. I learned a lot from that. I really enjoyed listening to how intentional he is with everything that he does. And it's clearly the reason why he's so successful with this stuff. He's very methodical about it, and the thought that he puts into miking stuff and selecting reverbs and all that kind of thing, it's, it's what makes his recording sound unique and what makes them sound special. So definitely something that is a great lesson to take from all of this. 
Also, it was very fascinating learning about his reverb techniques and especially the pink noise stuff that he talked about. I thought that was a really cool approach that I've never heard before. And it was also great to hear him talk about how to actually create IRs. And I think he's absolutely right that if you're trying to create something that sounds unique, what easier way to do that than to just use unique sounding spaces? So by creating some impulse responses like he talked about, you can really expand the texture of your tracks and get something that sounds really unique. So I think that that was a great lesson for him to share. And it's definitely something that you should certainly try out in your own recordings. So I hope that you enjoyed that episode. I hope that you found it fascinating and that you learned a lot from it as well. And if you did, make sure to subscribe to the podcast. That way you're notified about all new episodes as they go live each and every Wednesday morning. Now that I'm back in the routine of recording podcast episodes, we've got a bunch of great episodes lined up ahead for you. So you definitely don't want to miss out on those. And also make sure to visit MasterYourMix.com if you're looking for help on creating pro sounding recordings from your home studio and you need some guidance as to what tools to be using, what to be listening for, what steps to take. All of that you'll find on the masteryourmix.com website. And one resource that I definitely want to point you to is my book called The Mixing Mindset. And that is a book where I break down that process of mixing step by step and make it very simple for you to understand what goes into creating great sounding mixes. So definitely make sure to check that out. It's called The Mixing Mindset, and that's available at masteryourmix.com. So we've reached the end of this episode. Thank you so much for sticking around to the very end. And I can't wait to chat with you in the next one. Talk soon. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at MasterYourMix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com.